I'm Dr. Alvait Singh Ning Taujam, Assistant Professor at the Sambasa School of International Studies. I'll be your host for the fifth session today on a very important topic, diplomatic practices in, Indian, in foreign policy, the Indian way. Kindly allow me to introduce and invite the chair for the session, Ambassador Telmis Ahmed on the dais. Ambassador Ahmed is the former Indian ambassador to three very important countries, Saudi Arabia, Oman, and the UAE. Sir is currently the Ram Satya Chair in International Studies at the Symbiosis International University. May I also request the lead speaker for the session, Dr. Rahul Saga, and the discussions, Dr. Mehta Bisht and Professor Pankas Jha to join our chair on the dais. I request our chair to introduce the speakers and take the session forward. Over to you, Ambassador. Honorable Minister, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. We are deeply grateful to the Minister, Dr. S. Jayashankar, for having initiated this possibly first serious discussion relating to India's strategic culture, the challenges that we face in contemporary times, and what we need to do to equip ourselves to meet these challenges. Drawing from the past as our inspiration, drawing upon our history and culture to give us strength, and then using the wisdom of the past as well as the intellect of the present to see how we can go forward successfully. We have three parts to the discourse. Every session has to address this. Number one, India's strategic culture. After that, addressing global and regional challenges. The sessions that have gone ahead of us, before us, have explored different aspects of this. May I take the liberty and the opportunity of sharing with you my personal views with regard to some of these aspects. Strategic culture. This is a new concept. It is now entered IR discourse. It is still at a nascent stage. Enormous work is still in progress. It appears as if it draws upon a, the heritage of a nation and then seeks to understand what this means in terms of that nation and that people making strategic choices when they face various uh, when they face various challenges or opt for certain opportunities and lines of action this strategic culture obviously is the product of the long legacy the long history of those people. But it is a dynamic concept. It is not cast in stone that some long ago set of manuscripts have permanently defined us in a certain way. Not at all. There is certainly the value of literature. But even more than that is the value of the lived experience of those people. This experience is complex. And what the people have drawn from these experiences remains extremely dynamic and is subject to change. When we look at India, obviously how we have shaped our strategic culture would obviously be based on our rich heritage, the rich history that has been explored in considerable detail by various speakers. But what has been missing in this discourse to a considerable extent is the experience that India has had, indeed the Indian subcontinent, with the major influences that have occurred over the last millennium, particularly various people who have encountered indigenous people from time to time, and very often the experience of engaging with Muslims who emerged in the northern part of our country, as well as in southern part of our country, indeed in the south, there had been Arab people who had engaged with India for several centuries before the advent of Islam. Another aspect of our strategic culture and influence would be the experience of British colonialism. That here, like all other uh, very, uh, developed countries in Asia and Africa, we were subjugated by a superior force, superior in terms of military technology, superior in terms of science and technology as well. 
it was a total setback, a total defeat for most of us. And this led to this experience of engaging with this colonial power had enormous implications for us. It was the dawn of the modern age. So whatever had happened earlier was the pre-modern age where we were very similar to various others. And indeed, many of you know, in 1800, India and China together contributed about half of the global GDP. That began to change over the last two centuries. And that was a traumatic experience for us in India, as well as for other Asian people as well, and African people. But what did we do? We had a freedom struggle. A freedom struggle that brought together different segments of our population, engendered in them a certain sense of idea of their nation, of nationhood, and then moved forward vigorously in seeking back their heritage as an independent nation. All of this came together in our constitution. This was a difficult process. Let us be very clear about it. We had several hundred million people living here. We had not had experience of self-governance for a long time. We had intense debates all through the 19th century of, of what India should look like. Rahul Sagar in his recent work, outstanding work, has explored the thoughts of many of our people. Certain giants have emerged from the 19th century who had views about what India should be like, both in terms of its polity, in terms of its culture, in terms of its society. Raja Ram Mohan Rai, and then you had you know, Dayanand Saraswati, Vivekanand, Sri Aurobindo, all of these explored. But many others, quite anonymous at present, have also speculated about what India should be like. There was a great tumult at that time that finally those debates, those ideas fructified in the constitution of India. So the constitution of India that made India a sovereign democratic republic enshrined the aspirations of the people based on the values that we had had nurtured over the last three or four millennia all of them were there, and that is what made India, that is Bharat. Then we have the other formative influence, the most recent one, the experience of independence. 75 years plus now, this, all of that has shaped India. Let us be very clear, none of these experiences are rigid. All of them are constantly debated, discussed, reopened, reinvestigated, re-explored, and then a new consensus develops around certain ideas. This is the pattern of world history. You will see in many countries there have been this extraordinary trauma relating to the challenge to the political status quo of the time. In the, in the United Kingdom, in Great Britain, you had the revolution and the beheading of a monarch as parliament asserted its authority in the political order. In the case of France, you had a, a, a very, very major, harsh destruction of the political order and a new revolution. And of course, in the case of the United States, you had a questioning of the values of the American Constitution in the shape of the Civil War. So such questioning is legitimate and it occurs from time to time. It leaves the nation strengthened over a period of time. But at the end of the day, there has to be a consensus. The people around it have to agree with the new order that has emerged or the reaffirmation of the earlier order. If you have a debate that excludes large sections of the political order, you are actually, that is a certain recipe for instability, for disorder and for possible uh, violence as well. When we have had references to Tanum and what he wrote in 1992, he said India has no strategic vision, no security vision. There is no consensus on this. India's approach to security issues, Tanum wrote, is reactive, defensive, ad hoc, 
and short term. He had no idea of India. He was a colonel from the U.S. Army sent to investigate what was the scenario at, in this country after the Cold War. The Americans were already gearing up to co-opt us into their alignment that would emerge after the Cold War. And he made the study. The study is not his. It is the product of extraordinary inputs provided to him by senior and important strategic affairs thinkers in our country. So what he has said about being reactive, defensive, ad hoc and short term is a description of what he was told. And I very often asked myself while in service and after that out of it, is this still valid? Is this description valid? Does India have a consensual, uh, you know, does it have a consensual security vision over the longer term founded on a strategic culture that is the product of our rich history and our, and our recent experience? It is a difficult question, difficult answer to give you. My own sense is we have no long-term strategic vision whatsoever. Because we are still debating, as I speak to you, the idea of India. We are still debating what constitutes us as a nation. We've had the previous session, which for me was the most traumatic experience that I have had in many years, which excluded large sections of our people from the vision of our nation. A nation, an idea of India founded so exclusively, so narrowly, and that has nothing to do with our lived experience. That it excluded large sections of this audience as well. So I think there is something that we need to do better than what we are doing present. What have we, this strategic culture, which we have had for so long, and which is being so robustly questioned at, at present, and in my opinion, narrowly questioned, what did it give us? What kind of foreign policy did we have? a very strong affirmation of strategic autonomy. Right from the beginning, from 1947 till today, strategic autonomy has remained the, the central, the core value of our foreign policy. And in various times, numerous people have attempted to co-opt us from time to time, but we have resisted that. We have also our own heritage of diversity, unity in diversity, the experience of diversity has equipped our diplomacy to engage with people different from us. We have a heritage of long-term engagement, of extensive engagement all across the world. In ancient times, we have had Indian mathematicians and astronomers in the Sumerian court and in the Egyptian court. Our people have encouraged and, and have lived together with various other, various other people. You recall here, it's not as if we were accommodative here. Others also accommodated us. We were, a, we were a traveling people, traveled all across Central Asia, traveled across the Indian Ocean. This was the, called the Indian Ocean because Indians were constantly traveling on this ocean towards the east and towards the west. Uh, we have had Indian colonies, communities of Indians with families living in Oman over the last 1,000 years living in peace, and actually a cherished community, just as we cherished the presence of Arabs in southern India for so long. So we were open to diverse engagements. We also used force when it was necessary. And the, in the, just as we had independence and we were assaulted from Pakistan, we resisted that, robustly resisted that, and ensured that a large part of Jammu and Kashmir remained a part of India. Even when we were integrating our country, we had to use force in Hyderabad, and we used it. And we used force in Goa when we had to. We've used force, but we also recognize, and that is the wisdom of our heritage, that war very rarely solves issues. Look at the experience of the United States in Vietnam and in Iraq and in Afghanistan. A superpower brought to the ground by resistance elements. So these are, this is the way we learn that this is, war is not the answer, diplomacy is. We therefore 
have had, the strength of India has been based on what is nowadays referred to as soft power. What has been our soft power? What has been the model we have presented to the world? The model of national unity. We were a rainbow nation many decades before South Africa. We brought extraordinarily diverse people together. People who have lived with each other, cherished each other, developed a composite culture. If Dr. Desi Raju spoke of the symbol of India being certain idols under the tree, which we venerate, May I give him an opposing uh, concept as well? Another concept, not opposing, a supplementary concept. The shrine at Ajmer Sharif. 50% of the people who come there are not Muslim. It's not a Muslim shrine. It is an Indian shrine. And that is what we venerate. Think of that, that that is what brings people together. And across our country, from Kashmir to Kerala, we have such shrines that bring people together not peop and don't put people apart. We've also had the sense of accommodativeness, a sense of bringing a multicultural order that celebrates our diversity at all times and brings them all together in a democratic framework. This has been our strength. We have an aspiration. The aspirations were articulated during the freedom struggle in 1947 and continuously, and it has been repeated by Prime Minister Modi. We think that we, as a result of our culture, as a result of our economic prowess, as a result of our military capabilities, we should be at the global high table. That is where we feel we belong, and that is where we feel that we should be able to, to take care not only of India's interests, but the interests of the nations, the developing nations that look towards India for guidance and support. This is the way, now when we look at the third point, global and regional challenges. We all know it is a well-established fact that the world is in disorder. The givens of the past where you had a hegemon is now under stress. The hegemon is in retreat. The hegemon is being challenged. It's a very untidy scenario, a conflictual scenario, it may be said. At the top level, there is also an attempt to stabilize the competitive relationship and put in place certain norms and rules. But the fact remains that we are in the midst of this because the competing factor, uh, we have two powers, the United States and China, and India has substantial ties with one and is being challenged by the other even as we share a border of 4,000 kilometers with China. It is in this scenario that we need to have a serious diplomatic effort and this is what this session will discuss. India's own strategic space is being challenged. It is not just the Indian Ocean, it is all across Eurasia, all across West Asia, all across Southeast Asia and the so-called Indo-Pacific. This space that is India's strategic space and where India's long-term interests lie is today encroached upon. We always focus on the presence of the Chinese Navy. Do recall here, ladies and gentlemen, you have a major expansion of the American Navy, the British Navy, the French Navy, and even the German Navy. None of us knew the Germans had a Navy, but they are also saying, that, oops, we also want to be there. They are all going to make the Indian Ocean into a conflictual zone where we will have certain challenges to our own long-term security. Therefore, where are we going now? We need to develop a strategic culture that is truly exclusive, truly celebrates our past, truly brings everyone together. It is not exclusive and doesn't keep people out. And we need a diplomacy founded on these bases and that is what my colleagues will now discuss before you. Rahul Sagar will, will set the stage with his substantial presentation on diplomatic practices in foreign policy, the Indian way. Thank you. I will show you this slide and I will come back to what it means much later, but it links to the fact that we are in Pune at this wonderful university. And it's one of the very first paintings that was ever made in modern India, when the company artists, as it's called, company art, when the company artists came to this uh, uh, region, 
And this was one of the very first paintings they ever drew in 1791, the English learning and loving the game of chess or shatranj from a Maratha nobleman. Before I go any further, I should say two things. First, there's a line in the Brihaspati Sutra, which I'll talk about shortly, which says, never tells the king, never decline an unwelcome speech or an unpleasant speech. I hope you won't decline my unpleasant speech. It has a little bit of unpleasantness in it. And if you don't believe in the Brihaspati Sutra, please keep in mind I'm from Haryana. And so, <laughs> you, So what I want to talk to you about is one specific aspect of the, of the story that's laid out. There are many, as, as uh, Ambassador Emmett was just saying, there's many different elements to the uh, event that we've organized. I wanted to focus on one particular part of it in the limited time uh, available to me, and that's the Indian way. I want to dis divide this discussion into three clear, distinct pieces, because I think each of them involves something very different. The past, the present, and the future. What is the Indian way? more or less, in each of those contexts. There's lots of complexity, there's lots of variation. I have limited time, so I'll have to simplify some of my remarks. Please don't take me to be excluding or limiting the conversation. All right, so when we turn to the past, what do we see? If we look at the very long story, if we go back to 2,000 years, or two and a half thousand years, we see that our traditions, our big texts, make two very standard points about diplomacy. This is, you can take the Manuspriti, you can take the, uh, the Niti tradition, you can take the Agni Purana, you can take the Tirukal, you can take the Brihaspati Sutra, which I just mentioned. Text after text after text makes two points. I've taken some examples from the Manuspriti, but you will find identical ideas across this entire tradition. What does it say? One of the very essential points, the non-negotiable point, is that international politics is about interests. There's relatively little discussion about ethics, relatively little discussion about global responsibilities. International politics is about interests. And as that verse 102 down there says, let the king be ever ready to strike, his prowess constantly displayed, his secrets constantly concealed, and let him explore the weaknesses of his fault. Our ancestors were incredibly clear-eyed about what the nature of international politics is and was. Or take another line. This is also from the Manuspriti, uh, uh, verse 110. As the weeder plucks up the weeds and preserves the corn, even so even let the king protect his kingdom and destroy his opponents. There's no half measures here. This is not language for Twitter. This is language for kings to teach you the, es the essence of politics. And this is a language for the king's counselors. The second crucial lesson from our history, from our tradition, is that you will not be able to pursue your interests if you don't have prudent leadership. So again, in all these books I mentioned, all the way down to things like the Agni Purana and the, and the Niti Sara, which were written in the medieval period, there is absolute clarity on this idea. Again, this is once more just from the Manusmriti for ease of reference. Uh, verse 64 lays out one of the earliest verses to talk about politics, lays out the most important command. You must be clear about the kinds of people you pick if you want to succeed in international politics. So an ambassador is to be commended to the king who's loyal, honest, skillful, possesses a good memory, knows the proper place and time, is handsome, ambassadors, this applies to you, um, fearless and eloquent. These are essential properties, and they're explained as the text goes on as to why each one of them is deeply important. Now, we've heard from other speakers uh, yesterday and earlier today about the kinds of strategies and tactics that you need to use in international politics. They're complicated, and our tradition is incredibly rich. I won't go into those details. That's not my point here, or that's not my purpose here. What I want to emphasize your mind is just on these two ideas. International politics is about interests. You won't succeed in pursuing those interests unless you pick the right kinds of people. That's the past. Then something dramatic happened. Until, roughly speaking, 1818 or 1820, we had principalities in which these texts were read and practiced on an annual basis. There was no question about it. If you look at any of the principalities or the native states or the princely states, as sometimes they're called, 
you will find uh, that the, the counselors know Sanskrit or know their, the vernacular version, whether it's in Malayalam or in Tamil, of these classical texts, read them, study them, cite them. If you look at the primary materials in the archives, you'll see this without a doubt. By 1820, most Indian native states have been so deeply brutalized and weakened that these traditions start to fall away. And in any case, all of them give up their foreign policy or their international relations to the British. The British are the paramount power. The princely states are allowed to govern their own domestic relationships, their own domestic politics, whether it's Mysore or Baroda or Sindhya, etc. But they can't take part in international politics. And so after 1819, a very different set of ideas appears on the scene. Two things come into place. First, starting in 1830, the British introduce uh, uh, English education, Western education, and the prevailing idea in England at the time, which is not read and practiced by the English diplomats, but is read and practiced in English society, are liberal ideas which tell you, you should not simply think about yourself as belonging to a collective, you're a member of a broader humanity. You have an individual interest. You're an individual, and so is everyone else. So your interests have to be tempered by the interests of other individuals. So liberalism starts to put in place this, this, uh, the standard text that's read is John Stuart Mill or Adam Smith or David Hume, all of whom call for a more conciliatory international politics. So the, the lessons of the past, international politics is about interest and what matters is who you choose, those are replaced by new ideas that emphasize democracy, choice, variety, variation. And the second stream that appears at this time is Orientalism. This is, I've picked, unfortunately picked on one person given this, this setting. Please don't start uh, disliking him or think I'm picking on him in particular. This is one of the most famous Orientalists of the 19th century, Rajendra Lal Mitra. And what he does at this time is produce the first modern version that we have of Kamandakini's uh, 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 Niti Sara. And uh, he, he writes an introduction to it, which really sort of symbolizes this change. All these years, two and a half thousand years, we've had a very clear idea of what our tradition teaches. And in his introduction, Rajendra Al Mitra, who's a remarkable person, an institution builder, a learned person, recovers, works very hard to recover these texts, takes the liberal education he's had, takes this orientalist education that says what's important about India is not its tradition of statecraft, but its tradition of a concern for moksha and enlightenment and spirituality. That's what the orientalists teach us. India is about spiritual realization, transcendence. Forget this world. This world's meaningless. It's the next world and the afterlife that are important. So having read those orientalists, having studied liberal ideas, Rajendra Al Mitra writes this preface to the Niti Sara, and he says, the gravity of the text is oriental, but its morality is more like Machiavelli. He says, the, the notorious historiographer of Florence than the successors of Brigu and the great sages of ancient India. And so he goes on <laughs> down here, which is the bit that's the most interesting. He says, thankfully, this defect in Kamandakini and in the Niti Sara is only confined to its diplomacy. So just ignore the diplomatic parts of the Niti Sara and just focus on all the other things that the king should do, be good to his subjects, invest in public infrastructure. All of that stuff is good. Ignore the bits on diplomacy. Uh, it's all very bloody and violent and, and out of date, out of date. So between, uh, towards the end of the 19th century and then at the beginning of the 20th century, we see a fundamental transformation, a tradition that had been alive, that had been practiced, that had been cited, until 1820 suddenly starts to fade away. The fading is slow, but it's very clear. And by 1919, there's a very specific reason for that year. That's the year in which the First World War ends and the brutality of that war makes people certain that these two things we learned in the last century, they were good and actually we should extend them. So the liberals taught you to be cosmopolitan. Well, we need more than that. And the orientalists taught you to care about spirituality. Well, we need more than that. And the answer to those two things were collective security. The cosmopolitan said, well, we'll find security in groupings. Those that are also colonized, that became the anti-colonial movement. Those that are also Asian, that became the pan-Asiatic movement. Those that are also subjugated and members of the Islamic faith, that became the pan-Islamic movement. A move from cosmopolitanism, well, 
cosmopolitanism failed, it wasn't enough, but let's find security in groups. And the other move, the Orientalists, the people that said life is about much more than this mundane world, gross material interests, selfishness, let's move beyond that. Simply relying on philosophy is not enough. We need to actually begin practicing renunciation, renouncing violence in particular, and we need to move towards a world that's more pacific. So if you look at the texts of the Indian National Congress, which created its foreign policy cell in the, in the uh, early 1920s, there's a prominent book that tries to sum summarize, written by Ramana Lohia in, uh, this was 1938, trying to summarize, and he had taken over from Jawaharlal Nehru, who was the first founder of this cell. And so what does Nehru write in his foreword? This language, this set of ideas, is completely, as I've been saying to you, that's why I started by showing you the past, it's something completely different from what we've thought or what we've read in our tradition. And so Nehru writes, uh, if you look at the second last line, if the world is to progress in culture and civilization, it'll have to adopt peaceful methods of solving its problems. This is not at all what the Manuspriti or the, or the, or the Mahabharata or the, uh, the, any of the Niti tradition teaches us. It goes further. I was just explaining to you there's this search for peace and prosperity uh, that we see, and Nehru is a good example of that desire. We've got to move beyond a world of conflict. The person that we most associate with the other idea, pacifism, so not just seeking, seeking security in groups, but seeking security in renunciation. The world will be better off, we'll be better off if we give up on violence, is, is Gandhi. And so there's a, one of my side jobs is to collect as much of Indian intellectual history as I can. And one of the things that I found is a journal called The Jewish Advocate, which was a publication actually run out of Bombay, which had in the past, it still has a small, but in the past had a substantial Jewish community. They ran uh, two, well, over time, six different Jewish uh, periodicals out of Bombay. One of them at this point in the 1930s was called The Jewish Advocate. And in it, Gandhi was invited to answer the question, how should the Jews respond to what Hitler was threatening to do to them? So Gandhi wrote a, a reply called, If I Were a German Jew, which subsequently was published in his collected works. And this is what he says there. If I were a Jew and were born in Germany and earned my livelihood there, I would claim Germany as my home, even as the tallest Gentile German may and challenge him to shoot me or cast me in a dungeon. If all the Jews were to accept the prescription here offered, they cannot be any worse off than they are now. And suffering voluntarily undergone by them will bring them an inner strength and joy which no number of resolutions and sympathy can give them. And then he says at the end, the calculated violence of Hitler may even result in a general massacre of the Jews, this is in 1938, by way of his first answer. But if the Jewish mind could be prepared for voluntary suffering, even the massacre, it could be turned into a day of thanksgiving. For to the God-fearing death has no terror. It's a joyful sleep. Now, as you can imagine, the Jewish community wasn't entirely pleased with that suggestion. So they pushed back and said, clearly this can't be the answer to someone like Hitler. To which Gandhi replied, no, he still believed in that idea. This is exactly what he said. I see no reason to change the opinion I've expressed in my article. It's highly probable that if a Jewish Gandhi in Germany should arise and should function, he would function for about five minutes and would be promptly sent to the guillotine. But that does not disprove my case or shake my belief in the efficacy of Ahimsa. I can conceive the necessity of the immolation of hundreds, if not thousands, to appease the hunger of dictators. This is entirely unlike our tradition. It is irresponsible. That was the past. It was a past that we lost, and I've tried to explain to you a reason why we lost that past. Then we switch to the present. The traditional approach that I've just been describing to you died, or almost died out, but it didn't die out completely. If we look at, the, uh, at, the, at our archives, which are in a perilous state, but if we spend our time uh, weeding our way through this history, we'll see that there was, throughout this time, a rear guard action, people fighting back one after another, pushing back against liberalism that led to cosmopolitanism, that led to a search for security in groups, against orientalism, that led to spiritualism, that led to pacifism, against both these movements, there was always, throughout this time, there was never a complete break. There was always a set of voices that pushed back. 
So Satyat Prakash, or the Light of Truth, was a modern version of the Manusmriti. It basically is an edited version, a reduced version of the Manusmriti that the Anand Saraswati produced. And the story goes on and on. I can't go through all of the history here, um, but in Aurobindo, we see exactly the same references to the duty of the Kshatriya, for instance, which is one of his essays. He doesn't mean by that the term Kshatriya and caste. He means by that the function, the warrior. Um, and, um, and then the most famous example of all of this era, the great and glorious Maharaj Tilak, his book, Gita Rahasya, is a direct response. I cannot emphasize to you enough the importance of reading these books, which is why I'm showing you the cover. Don't believe me. Don't believe anyone else. Read the books for yourself. They're all available freely. Go to archive.org. You can read them. Tilak summarizes the Gita with just one line. One line. It doesn't take much of your time. One line. He says, if something has to happen, something needs to be done. If nothing is done, nothing will happen. Seems very simple. Seems trivial. What's he saying under there? What's his response? The response is to Gandhi, with whom he has an explicit debate about how you interpret the Gita. For Tilak, the Gita teaches action. Be desireless, but be prepared to act. Be prepared to act. Don't wait for the fruit of your actions. Don't undertake actions for its fruit. But your duty is to act. And Gita Rahasya contained and continued this tradition. And there's no wonder that when Tilak died, people like Aurobindo wrote for him, as they did for Bankim, for instance, read Dharma Tattva, Bankim's great celebration of the importance of defending. Bankim is a cosmopolitan. He believes in cosmopolitanism, but he says your duty to your nation comes first, and you have to act to preserve your nation. Tilak reads Bankim, Aurobindo reads Tilak, and the story goes on. That's the story until about the early 1900s. Tilak writes uh, Gita Rahasya when he's imprisoned in, in Burma at that point, Myanmar today, in Mandalay. He passes away and a new generation arises. And this generation has to operate under very different circumstances. And that's one of the things I want to emphasize your mind on, concentrate your mind on. Two things fundamentally change in India in the 19th and 20th century. And we are still living with the effects of that. One, I've already hinted at, democracy appears. Democracy is not the same thing as the world in which the Manusmriti or uh, any of the Niti books were written. They were addressed to monarchs and to counselors. But now, if you want to resurrect this tradition, if you want to keep it going, you have to make your peace with the fact that you live in a world in which people expect that they will be allowed to express their, their views. So the emergence of democracy is one. And there's a second, the emergence of international problems. The world of the Manusmriti, the world of 2,000 years ago, the world of even 800 years ago, is entirely unlike our world because of simple constraints of communication and travel. We couldn't have been colonized in the way that we were colonized in the 19 or 1800s. We couldn't have been colonized in that way in the primitive, in the, in the, in the ancient world, because there simply weren't shipping methods available to us that could have allowed any large number of troops to make it safely across very large distances. But by the time we're in the early 20th century, we are interconnected in all sorts of ways. We're interreliant and interdependent, and this is a new world. So if you want to resurrect the past, if you want to return and retrieve something from the past, you're going to have to be able to deal with a world that's interconnected. So two things have changed. There's democracy, not monarchy. There's interconnection, not isolation. And so when in the 20th century, people begin to try to resurrect our traditions, they have to deal with this challenge. They belong to political parties. They're not counselors to kings anymore. And so, again, I want to emphasize to you, and I've, I sense from some of the questions I've heard, you might be skeptical or doubtful. You might think uh, some of what you're subjected to is PR. Read these texts for yourself. Don't let other people tell you what you should or should not read. Don't let other people denigrate and tell you, surely you won't read Golwalkar, surely you won't read Savarkar, surely you won't read S.P. Mukherjee. Don't make that mistake. You can only form your own opinion by reading these people, reflecting on what they have to say, and then making up your own mind instead of prejudging the outcome. So when you start reading these texts, you start to see something very different. And the key turning moment is Dindayal Upadhyay's Integral Humanism. It says, look, the world has changed, and so we have to come up with new answers to the question, how do we humanize the statecraft tradition, which, as I said to you, has makes no qualms. International politics is like pulling weeds out of the ground. Get rid of your enemies. Upadhyay, and he's not alone. It's not like he just suddenly drops out of the sky. I can't give you the full story. I don't have enough time. 
but there's a dozen thinkers that come before him that shape this idea that we have to behave in a more responsible fashion. Hence that third bullet point. We have to think about our responsibilities to each other, to living under modern conditions, to the extractive nature of modern capitalism, which worries people in, uh, in this line of thinking a great deal. We have to worry about preserving the planet, the, the uh, living beings. We talked yesterday about the importance of ecological consciousness. This is something that plays a very important part in Upadhyay's um, thinking. Um, if we are going to resurrect our traditions, we're not going to simply resurrect just the statecraft part, we're going to resurrect the ethical parts as well, and not just for ourselves, but we're going to project them outwards. We're going to be a distinctive power. So if our, if our ancients had a distinctive idea of what the India way was, I want you to understand that our modern thinkers also have a distinctive idea of the India way. These two things are not identical. Our worlds have changed, and so our ideas have changed. If you go back to the Niti tradition, you will not see the emphasis on responsibilities or the global commons that you see in books today. We have to think anew. And so if we are proud of our ancestors, we can also be proud of the things that we are thinking about today. And there's certain specific sets of things that that then means. You can all read the India way. I won't summarize it for you. I think you've had a sense of what that uh, means from the minister's wonderful, uh, outstanding speech yesterday. I wanna push back a little bit and emphasize these two points. If we are to resurrect the lessons of the Mahabharata, if we are to resurrect the lessons of the Gita or the Ramayana, we have to do them under very different circumstances and that makes it incredibly challenging for us. These challenges all emerge from the fact that we have to do them under conditions of modern capitalism and modern democracy, right? When we look back at the Niti tradition, the emphasis is on knowledge, hence the choice of ministers. It's on energy and secrecy, hence all the strategy and tactics that you heard about yesterday. Democracy does not favor these things. So how are we gonna resurrect the India way? And you see this again and again in Dr. Jayashankar's book. These are some of the passages that I've taken from there. There's many more. It's a very craftly, carefully crafted book. I suggest reading it with a paper and pen because there's much written or much meant between the lines. So I've highlighted, I've tried to cheat a little bit and help you see some of these things. But look at the second one. One of, the, one of India's challenges is that it doesn't have a fully figured sense of an establishment. Why would that matter? Well, the answer is down there, uh, the answer is up there on the first one. It's only when a national elite has a strong and validated sense of its bottom issue or bottom line that it will take a firm stand. This needs underlining in a climate where judgments are sometimes made with a yardstick of popularity rather than strategy. So you can see the kinds of challenges, especially for the young diplomat uh, probationers that are here, you can see the kinds of challenges you're gonna to have to work with. If you wanna resurrect the India way, it's under very different circumstances and that means having to grapple with, grapple with our changed circumstances. It's not going to be a simple or linear process. So these are the two things I think we have to think about. Since this is a, um, uh, recorded and live streamed event in the interests of uh, uh, secrecy and keeping myself uh, alive and keeping a job. I can't say all that I would say on these two fronts. I was advised by one of my gurus to uh, put everything you want to say as a question. Uh, that's a better way of staying alive. So can we create a unified national will? That's an immensely important question. Uh, we see moves towards this. Uh, one clear example is having a unified electoral uh, cycle. I cannot emphasize to you how important that is. Accomplishing things like that will help us actually realize the more energetic tradition of diplomacy that's our history. Our if you want to resurrect it, you're going to have to do things that, like that, that can concretize, that can actually uh, focus people's minds on questions and we aren't constantly in a cycle of chasing popularity. And second, can we create an establishment? This is, I think, a question that uh, Dr. Jay Shankar poses and he worries about. I spent the first 10 years of my life working on how the Americans created their establishment. And it was 10 very fruitful years. I learned a lot. It's an immensely complex and difficult process. Everything from students, colleges, newspaper editors, school textbooks, uh, the movies you make, the books you write, the things you promote, the agencies you construct, uh, the lectures you hear and deliver, all of this goes towards creating an establishment so that there is a bottom line. There's a unified sense. This transcends party boundaries. This transcends generations. 
It's something that's fundamentally important to us. If we don't create an establishment, we have very little hope of competing with other countries that do have an establishment. China has one, America has one, Europe has one that's in deep decline and we should learn from their example about how not to let what we've built decline. But these are the two great challenges we face if we want to resurrect our, our, uh, our traditions, our ways, the India way. Okay, so let me try and end by focusing on the future. I've talked about the past, the present, and the future. And the future, this is the bit where I had to even do away with graphics if I wanted to keep myself uh, intact. Uh, because um, we face, I think, two very specific kinds of problems. And these are going to further stress our attempt to create an India way. We're all well aware of the fact that we live, as I said, in an interconnected world. This has changed. Our traditions of statecraft said very little about what we should do beyond just managing the outside world. If you read the Niti books, they are entirely focused on keeping the outside world away. This is as true for China as it is for India. Very different from the Western tradition on statecraft. Keep the world away. So as long as they don't trouble us, we can, we can keep going. And the attempt is simply to deny, strategic denial. Don't let anyone get too close. Don't let your immediate neighbors be too powerful. Manage the environment around you. In an interconnected world, that's not possible. And so for the last 50, 60 years, since 1919, that, that year that I told you about, we've tried to rely on global governance of one kind or another. We've called it different things. But we've tried to rely on global institutions to save us from the problems, from the downsides of interconnectedness. So the India way didn't have to worry too much because something else was dealing with it. We didn't have to deal with it. Someone else was going to deal with it. I think it's become incredibly clear that this era is ending and that increasingly India will need to intervene on its own terms. We can't rely on global institutions to do many of the difficult things that need to be done. For example, just an example, please don't cite me on this or quote me even though this is being recorded. Suppose one of our neighbors became unpopular with the United States and the United States decided it wanted to replace the regime there. And the regime that we know will appear as a result of this regime change is immensely problematic. It may lead to further misgovernance in this small neighbor to our east. And if that were to happen, we would be potentially a decade from now, two decades from now, flooded by climate refugees because their economy doesn't grow, their systems and institutions collapse, and we are confronted with not thousands, not tens of thousands, but hundreds of thousands of economic and climate refugees. Global governance is not going to save us. The time for intervention is here. And so we will have to think anew. The Arthashastra will not teach you on how to manage those problems. We will have to think of the solution. Those of you that are going to become diplomats are going to have to deal with that. That's going to be one of your pressing most climate change, AI, financial contagion, all of these are the problems that you're going to have to deal with for which there won't necessarily be easy answers. And there's a flip side to the story, and this makes me even more worried for my career. If interconnectedness is a problem because others misgovern themselves and we have to go there and fix the problem, as we tried to do in Sri Lanka and then since then have curled ourselves up and not done that as much, if, if misgovernance by others is a problem, there's a reverse side. It's others trying to affect our governance. Interconnectedness has two sides. One, we go out and try and solve problems there, but other people think they have, that we have problems that they need to solve, supposedly. So globalization helps foreign actors intervene here, and we're especially exposed as a result of globalization. We speak English, we're not protected by language. Lee Kuan Yew, the founder, the founder of modern Singapore, after he saw the hippie and beat movements in the 60s and 70s, he began to encourage the study of Mandarin. Why? Or the mother tongue. Why? Because he realized that the only communities, the only communities in Singapore that were not affected were those that were traditional and kept with their language and so weren't influenced by the beat and hippie movements. But those who were, unfortunately like me, westernized, were. They were swept away by the most recent ideas. And one idea after another idea after another idea, and you forget who you are. You just simply are whatever is present, current. And so a democracy is extremely exposed. And so what do we do about that? The single biggest challenge that those of you now in this foreign service, but especially in the years ahead, you're going to face this challenge that I think we are all just about starting to come to grips with. If interconnectedness is, if that means that our values and our ways of life are questioned, combated, undermined, our democracy is interfered and intervened in by outsiders, 
The narrative is set by others. Yesterday, Dr. Jay Shankar said, we have to build our own narrative. I completely agree with him. That's one of the reasons I'm here. That's why I want you to learn from everyone. But I also want to remind you of how incredibly difficult it is to build a narrative. It's very difficult to build an establishment. It's even more difficult to build a narrative. And there's a really simple example of it. Think of it every day when you do this. When you open up your phone, you use a QWERTY key, 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 um, keyboard. The letters are organized in a certain way. You start using them from when you're very young. And once you've learned to type on a QWERTY keyboard, it's very hard to change. Once your reflex instinct is to open up the New York Times to get your news about India, it's already too late. Right? You're reading the wrong thing. But who's going to change your mind now? Who's going to change your habits? So it's incredibly difficult to build your own narrative without also using disconnection. And it's sacrilegious for me to say this probably here, but there's a lot that we can learn from China. And if you don't like me saying China, then there's a lot we can learn from Singapore. They have found ways to disconnect themselves creatively. I'm not, I'll be the last person on earth to tell you that we should close ourselves. I'm not gonna suggest import substitution. I'm not gonna say, let's not have laptops. I'm not gonna say, uh, let's close ourselves from outside influences. This, the signature feature of Indian modernity is that we have voluntarily gone out in search of knowledge. Most of you will believe, completely wrongly, that English came to India because of Thomas Macaulay, that the British came and introduced English, and that's why I speak in English and you listen to me in English. Not true. The first English school in India was created in Tanjore in 1784 by Raja Tuljarji voluntarily. He gave the land and the money for the school and endowed it, and the teachers were Germans from Dutch Trankabar. So please understand that our history, our modernity, is founded on us trying to get the most out of the world. So I'm, not going, to, I'm going to be the last person to suggest that we should close ourselves from the world. But disconnection is something that we will have to think about because it's not easy to change a narrative um, when you're a, a rising power. There are established powers that are significantly more powerful than you. So to summarize, going forward, diplomats will need to defend our right and our duty to intervene in other places where bad things are happening that can affect us. They will also need to defend our choices. And I've seen many a diplomat that's uncomfortable to get into the world of values. They want to be an executor. My political uh, uh, principal, my, my political leader has given me a message. It's not for me to then go further than my brief. But unfortunately, in a world in which the world that is emerging, the world that's being born before our eyes, the battle between civilizations are not just about trade treaties, negotiations, this or that clause. It's about values. And you're going to have to become very clear about what our traditions are. If you want to defend the India way, you're going to have to become incredibly clear about what that, what that means. And then you're going to need a very wide spectrum of capabilities. We're going to need our own TV channels. We're going to need our own services. And this is what I meant by disconnection. If we simply rely on existing structures, institutions, capabilities, if you rely on universities in the West, or elsewhere for that matter, then we are simply not going to be able to create a narrative. That's the constraint. Okay, so let me go back to that picture that I started with, and I'll, I'll, I'm almost done, Ambassador, I'll be done in two more minutes. Why did I start with this picture? This painting, which is, one, as I was saying, one of the very first paintings in India, was made in 1791. 1791 was a beautiful year, particularly for the Marathas. In 1761, they'd lost at Panipat, nearly lost, or had lost much of their empire in the north. For the next 30 years, they worked so incredibly hard. They were led by ministers, the Peshwas and their, and their Fednavis, Nana Fednavis, who I'll show you in a second. And they were led by Mahadaji Sindhi, who went on, that's the person on the right, that's him in his Dirbar and uh, up in Hindustan, and this is uh, Nana Fadavis in, in, in Pune. These are some of the very first paintings we have of Indian officials. Uh, this was made by Robert Mabon in 1798. And um, what did they accomplish? Fadnavis engaged in diplomacy of the most astute kind. Almost none of you will really know any of the details, and that tells you how weak we are in our understanding of the past. But the first anglo maratha war saw him stitch together a coalition that gave the English, the East India Company, such an immense beating that at the end of the first anglo maratha War, the Crown demanded that the company, they couldn't bail the company out of all their military problems, demanded that the company issue a letter promising the Marathas that we have no desire for any further conquest in, 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 in India, in the subcontinent. Please leave us alone, forgive us. 
That was the letter that was sent out in 1782. I have a book coming next year that republishes that letter. Fadnavis was the reason that happened. And after him came Sindhya, who for the next 20 years, from, from 1770 roughly, all the way through the 1780s, built the most powerful military that we have ever seen on the subcontinent. It had cannons, it had its own medical units, it had its own resources, it wasn't based on taxation and snatch and grab, it had its own organized tax structure, it had pensions for invalid soldiers. It was considered by the British to be the most fearsome military they come, they, they'd ever confronted. In the second Anglo-Maratha war that came shortly after Madhaji died, this military that he constructed went up against, he'd only had 20 years, 20 years. This military went up against the Duke of Wellington, Arthur Wellesley, the person who, who defeated Napoleon and made Britain the hegemon of Europe. This was the beginning of Wellesley's career. He wanted to make a name for himself. He attacked at Assein in 1803, he attacked the Marathas. This military that Sindhya built destroyed 40% of Wellesley's troops. Two of Wellesley's horses were shot from under him, which means if the cannonball had been a few inches higher, we might be speaking French instead, right? The power of Sindhya in 20 years to con fundamentally, he engaged European mercenaries because he wanted to learn modern drill techniques from them. He engaged modern cannon, cannon manufacturing methods. He put together the resources, what we talk about today is the supply chains to make sure these cannons could be constructed and worked with. All of this was accomplished such that by 1791, in 1790 he defeated the Rajputs. In 1791 where that painting was made, the Marathas were once again the ascendant power in, in, in the subcontinent. This is what the map looked like back then. So 17, this, this, this map is just before Wellesley, not Arthur Wellesley, not the Duke of Wellington, his brother, Richard Wellesley, who became the governor general. This is just before he comes in 1795. The British are just these shaded bits, as you see on the eastern flank of India. This is how it looked by 1805 after the Second Anglo-Maratha War. What happened in the Second Anglo-Maratha War? Holkar broke with Sindhya, the Marathas fell apart. Sindhya fought first, lost, in spite of having inflicted such enormous damage on, on, uh, on Wellesley. Then Holkar fought separately and also suffered immense damage as a result. So divided, the Marathas collapsed. For all their immense abilities, for all their learning, for all those 20 years of intense effort, for all their attempts to resurrect Maratha greatness, for all their brotherhood, it didn't come to much. And this is what the map looked like by 1818. After the third Anglo-Maratha war, Sindhya decided not to take part in it. Holkar's entire administration had fallen apart. The Peshwa fought alone, and the war ended tragically. So what do we learn from this? We taught the English the game of chess, and we were outwitted at the game of chess. The great lesson, if we want to strive for greatness, if you want to bid for greatness, we have to understand why we failed in our last bid for greatness. We have to study the history of the Marathas and think about them and think about our, if you care about the India war, something went wrong. And the answer lies in those two things as I was talking about. We did not have sufficient establishments. We did not have um, unity or, or a unified national will. Those are two things without which it'll be very difficult. And I'll leave you with this line that haunts me. I think about it all the time. Throughout the 19th century, Indians thought about why it was, because it was in their living memory. They knew people that had fought in the third Anglo-Maratha war. Indian intellectuals throughout the 19th century asked themselves again and again this one question. Why was it that the Marathas did not love their brothers, but no Englishman ever betrayed his country? They were Maratha turncoats, traitors, betrayers, but never an Englishman. Why? Thank you. So good afternoon, everyone. And uh, let me begin by saying that I'm indeed delighted to be here and would like to uh, thank uh, Sibyos' Institute of International Studies for this kind invitation. Well, I shall take this conversation further uh, by starting from where Dr. Sagar left. He talked about the Indian way, but stopped short of articulating it, restricting it to the unified national will. Unified national will, to my mind, can be instrumentally forged, it can be mechanical, or it can be transformational and reflective. 
The Indian thought offers a vision of unity and diversity. We talked about it in the morning. It offers us the wisdom to see through a web of connections that we inhabit, an aspect that I will really take forward in the second part of my presentation when I talk about the Indian way in, in some detail. Um, Dr. Sagar also pointed out that the Indian thought has three strands, the way he looked at history, realism, liberalism, orientalism, defining orientalism as transcendentalism. I feel what informs the Indian way is mutually constitutive of these multiple strands, and one does not necessarily have to choose one over the other, one does not necessarily have to choose brute force over soul force. For example, let me pick up the concept of emancipation here. Unlike Marxism, emancipation in Indian philosophy has a holistic definition. It is both spiritual and physical emancipation. So when Gandhi really talks about soul force, he emphasized that soul force is the condition of brute force, arguing that one should fight evil rather than transcend it. This example should give a context to what is really meant by the Indian way. Thus, I'll take a two-pronged approach here in defining the Indian way, where I first look at the relationship between diplomatic thought and diplomatic practice. And second, I try to understand what sense can one really make of Indian diplomatic practices in the present. So let me begin by saying that diplomatic uh, 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 thought should not just be restricted to texts, Manusmriti, Prasvati Sutra, Niti Shatra, we've talked about it, but also to dance dramas, the stories of Hitop Desha, Panchatantra, Jatakas, the poetry of Thiruvalur, and games like Chaturanga, which I think is a predecessor of chess. All these sources of diplomatic wisdom talk about agility, they talk about flexibility, dynamism, keeping the strategic or the long-term vision in mind. So if you look for sources of diplomatic thought, I would say India can become a very rich minefield of ideas. And I would add here that when we talk about devising a distinct Indian way or try to develop our own institutions, we need to at least have a perspective on what the Indian tradition on diplomatic thought says about these questions. Now in 2020, I made an attempt to search for these answers in a book which I wrote, Kautilya's Arthashastra Philosophy of Strategy, which was published by Routledge. In this book, I made three specific arguments. First, there is a distinct Indian philosophical vision and thought, which was applied to the realm of state and statecraft. This meta-theoretical framework called Anavikshiki is an important contribution to the philosophy of science debates, which bridges the binary of positivism and post-positivism, something which Amrita Narlekar was also talking about yesterday while discussing values and interests. Second, there is a distinct grand strategic design which becomes visible as we read Arthashastra, where there is no separation between the Shaptang theory or theory of the state and the Shadgunya theory, or the theory of the mandala. In other words, Rajaniti, governance, and Kutaniti, statecraft, informed each other. And third, more importantly, the concept of order, defined as dharma, was an overarching framework. In fact, dharma becomes the quintessential entry point to interpret morality, duty, justice, rights, and even the broader questions which guided decisions to undertake war. The reason I invoke my book on Arthashastra here is because I want to emphasize the notion of order or the idea of balance, which to my mind has shared a preeminent place in India's diplomatic practice, and I intend to give a perspective to this specific aspect. By doing so, I also joined Dr. Sagar in talking about the revival of the Indian way, and like him, will take forward the challenges which the External Affairs Minister has posed in his book, Primarily, the challenge of developing institutional ability, one. And second, the political will to actively engage in balancing rather than being romantic and reactive. However, where I depart from Dr. Sagar is that I offer an alternative pathway in terms of translating and interpreting the Indian way. 
As I look into diplomatic practice, I feel that privileging order has been a quintessential way, for good or for bad, for understanding how India has exercised its agency in international relations. There have, of course, been variances in this order, or balance has been privileged by post-colonial India by different regimes. And while this has had a consequence for a neighborhood diplomacy, for domestic policies, it has also given a very distinct international identity to India as it has tried articulating its agency at the global level. I think when we talk about the revival of the Indian way, we should not be concerned too much with the idea of replanting the Indian way in the minds of the populace. Rather, we should be concerned about reaching out to explain why is the Indian way significant, reflecting on what value it really brings and critiquing where is it that it is lacking. Thus, in the second part of my presentation, I move beyond diplomatic thought and focus on the lessons offered by Indian diplomatic practice. I ask the question, what agency has India exercised in communicating the idea of the Indian way and how this agency should be exercised and judged from the lens of Indian thought? One can argue that the way the international has been conceptualized has been, of course, Eurocentrically determined. And there can be little potential for a post-colonial agency to influence and impact it. And I would say there is perhaps some truth in this argument. However, ignoring it and not taking cognizance of both thought and practice, I would say much of our analysis as students of international relations shall be shaped by the lenses of Hans Margenthau, John Meshimer, or even Alexander Wendt. I argue that to rescue oneself from such theoretical tropes, understanding diplomatic practices becomes important. This is because understanding diplomatic practices makes us observe the performative mode of inquiry, which, which is really the main focus, which means that one is then carefully observing those in-between spaces of performance and practice where fixed identities are not present, but in fact, they are negotiated and are sites of hybridity, having both elements of modernity and tradition. Thus, India might behave as a defensive realist or a liberal institutionalist. However, it would be neither of the either. I would like to foreground this argument by looking at India's diplomatic practice into specific issue areas. The first is India's response to the Doklam issue and India's engagement with Bhutan in the backdrop of Bhutan-China border negotiations. And second is India's posturing in space and while I do this, I call out insights that diplomatic practices have for the emergent India way. I chose these two cases because both of these cases reveal to me a really distinct way of India handling its diplomatic affairs. I thought this intervention is important because we are largely surrounded, I would say, by the vocabularies of hedging, swing state, strategic autonomy to capture India's foreign policy posturing. I believe there is something more to India's diplomatic practice that, than these vocabularies can offer. And my response to this is, is in the act, I would say, of balancing, where order is generally privileged. To this audience, I shall not really be delving into the details of the cases, but just draw attention to certain patterns which are important to my analysis. So let me turn to the cases now. First, Bhutan-China bilateral negotiations. Now, in 1984, China-Bhutan negotiations began at the bilateral level. Then for almost a decade, nothing moved between China and Bhutan. China came up with a formula of a package deal, where it wanted Bhutan to cede its claim in the western regions, which is of strategic importance to India, in exchange of claims that China was making in central Bhutan. When Bhutan did not really agree to this Chinese suggestion, both countries signed, that is Bhutan and China signed, the Maintenance of Peace and Tranquility Agreement in 1998. This was an agreement of friendship, and China for the first time recognized Bhutan's sovereignty and territorial integrity. It also noted that border would be freezed as of 1998, pending any further talks, and status quo on the boundary prior to March 1959 would be upheld. Significantly, post-1998, China adopts a 2 pronged approach. First, it continues to encroach Bhutanese territory, 
infrastructure is being built in the disputed borders. In fact, in the first decades of 2000, there was a bold resistance by Bhutanese National Assembly and in the public domain on this issue. Secondly, China also used the boundary talks as a platform to engage Bhutan, and the talks broadened not only to security issues, but also to economic cooperation. By 2010, both countries decided on joint field surveys to harmonize reference points and conduct an exclusive survey on disputed Western regions. By 2016, joint technical surveys were done, and expert groups from both sides had endorsed the surveys done in the Western sector. Well, as we all know, history happened in 2017. The Doklam standoff took place between China and India. June 2017 was the first time that an offensive position was taken by India, asking China for a return to the status quo pre-2017. In fact, post-2017, the then External Affairs Minister, Shushma Shwaraj, stated that the bilateral issue between Bhutan and China is of strategic concern to India, thereby implying that India is a legitimate stakeholder in the boundary demarcation between China and Bhutan. Well, 2017 to 2021 has been a significant phase when it comes to Bhutan-China border disputes for multiple reasons. A, positions of Bhutan, China, India have come out in the public domain. B, what has also come out are differences in the Chinese and the Indian perceptions in the way they really look at map-making exercise in Northern Himalayas. Third, while Bhutan in its public statement has articulated the Indian position, unlike 2000, when it was quite vociferous about Chinese encroachments post-2016, it has publicly said there is no encroachment by China inside the Bhutanese territory. And finally, given that there are border villages that have been made in the disputed areas, which one can sort of see through the satellite images, China is setting precedents of political practice versus legal frameworks in resorting to resolving border. So what has been the Indian reaction to this whole issue? Let me go back to the core question of balancing act that I raised before. India is, has not been reactive. In fact, I see an act of balancing being taken here. This balancing act constitutes of external balancing, internal balancing, and moral balancing. Regarding its external balancing, India has made very clear its collaboration with the United States. For instance, in 2022, India-US held military drills for the first time in the northern Himalayan borders. India has also made very clear, backed by military force, that it will not accept anything which disturbs the status quo. External balancing here is directed to China. Regarding internal balancing, India has upgraded its positions on ground, upgrading its border infrastructure, and synergizing contingency operations in the Eastern theater. Regarding moral balancing, India has been very cautious to my mind in not letting the China-Bhutan equation shape its bilateral relations with Bhutan. In fact, when it comes to India's diplomatic practice of moral balancing, it has always taken resort to the legal point of view. For, in, for example, India raised a 2012 expert group agreement of special representatives signed between China and India, which China has pushed aside. However, vis-a-vis -vis Bhutan, both countries have expedited their economic projects and in the near future we are yet to see how the legal framework between Bhutan and India will play out for tackling the issue of China. Well, let me conclude by turning your gaze to India's posturing on space and contextualizing the Balancing Act by arguing that I see a similar pattern here too. When it comes to moral balancing, India has adopted a legalistic stand on issues of space norms. India, for instance, in the open-ended working group on reducing space threats in September 22 argued for a legally binding solution to navigate the issue of space norms, also underlining who is framing these norms and how will these norms be understood by the other space-faring nations is important to understand. Secondly, when it comes to external balancing, India joined the Armitage Accord. India also plans to collaborate with Japan to send a probe, also referred to as the Chandrayaan-4 mission. In coming years, it is estimated that India's lunar South Pole capacity can help scale up some of the goals of the Armitage program to include lunar resource utilization. Some space analysts have in fact noted that India joining the Armitage Accord is indicative of an assertive Indian policy to counter China at the disputed order, border. 
Thirdly, when it comes to internal balancing, well, India has been upgrading its capability as a space-faring nation. More recently, it took, undertook the anti-satellite tests in 2019. In fact, many believe that these tests were to preempt the discriminatory move and the duplicity which India had witnessed in the nuclear non-proliferation regime. Now, with all this analysis, I think I'll conclude my presentation arguing that a dominant strand which emerged in Arthashastra was an order in my analysis. However, we need to also note how the tradition of dharma, and when I'm talking about the Indian way, dharma was another word for order, social and political order, in terms of how it really looked at both state and statecraft. But we also need to understand how the tradition of dharma order has evolved over a period of time in other philosophical strands as Buddhism and Jainism. So while Kautilya did talk about the upaya, upayas, Mahayan Buddhism has offered us the kushal upayas. Both these philosophical strands, however, highlighted a relational and a holistic way of thinking. In the 21st century, challenges to governance and diplomacy remain to be addressed. One cannot afford to be strategic and myopic at the same time by divorcing the Indian meta-narrative with the multiple micro-narratives. Indian approach offers insights for relational ways of thinking, and I would say in the realm of politics and geopolitics, for the Indian way to exercise its agency, a clarity of purpose needs to be articulated and cultivated both at the level of thought and at the level of action. So I'll stop here. Thank you. My job is to uh, keep you waiting for the lunch. So I will try to do it as quickly as possible. Uh, thank you, Symbiosis, for really uh, doing this wonderful work with regard to strategic culture, strategic thinking, strategic thought. The word strategic itself is very dynamic. It changes with time. It changes with your perception. It changes with your behavioral exposition of the leaders. If the leader is an economist, he might not see strategic as a very big issue. But if he's an intelligence guy or a military guy, for him, strategic is a completely different uh, word uh, altogether. Now, strategic culture, as already many people have talked about, historical, geographical, and cultural context, ideological foundations, political, economic, and social forces. And, and this strategic culture also depends upon the approaches that has been used to interpret uh, previously mentioned factors and why they have been uh, presented for public consumption. If you look into strategic culture, and if you take the Copenhagen School of Thought, the, it is a speech act. It, it matters that what a person is saying and how you are going to really uh, to consume that kind of a narrative in your larger discourse. Uh, when you look into India's approach with diplomatic practices, I think two things really stand out with regard to morality, high moral ground, ethics, with regard to consensus, which is very critical that you bring everybody together and talk about it. And also look how there is a middle ground where, where you can really reach out together. Let me tell you, India was a wonderful mediator in 60s and 70s when India's position on a number of issues were really sought out. When you look into India's diplomatic discourse over a period of time, you look into how this word unity with regard to Afro-Asian conference, Bandung and many others, have galvanized India into the larger stage. It is also seen from that point of view, the Tibet Agreement 1954, then you have Indo-Soviet Treaty 1971, India-Sri Lanka agreement, which again is 1987, and Indo-US uh, you know, uh, nuclear agreement, which is 2005. From India's position as a wish guru to wish mitra, it clearly shows that the teachers need to be friend when the audience wants to really understand it much closer. So this is a transformation which has happened over a period of time. Now, when you look into the strategic, and, and I, let me tell you, there is a lot of discourse which is happening in Southeast Asia that what can we really take from India? and I was very recently to Vietnam, the one thing which really stood out was strategic autonomy. When ASEAN is discoursing about strategic autonomy, the one example which stand out is India. And they said, what exactly can we carry forward from it? And let me also take, tell you a few of the examples that, 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 that has been really taken forward for. If we talk about how India has galvanized the third world with regard to Global South and other issues, let me tell you, Indonesia has also adopted a term which is known as Panchshil, already influenced by us. When you look into consensus building, ASEAN, the consensus making, the ASEAN way, it again is one of the reflections which shows that how ASEAN also functions, taking a leaf out of it. 
Also, when you look into this aspect, which have been talked about in various of the discourses, Hitopadesha, Manusmriti, Agni Purana, and others, they have all devoted sanctions about statecraft and external relations. And there is nothing wrong to say that Indians uh, have been thinking about these issues, and it is a wrong concoction which has been served towards that Indians were uh, not strategically thinking in a number of areas. Uh, interestingly, India's strategic is a, a thinking is more of a mosaic, mosaic of culture, interpretation, perceptions, and options that we are really taking uh, from different point of view. Dharma itself has been lot talked, a uh, lot been talked about the peace initiative, where you want to really work for the peace, and Gandhi has been one of those uh, persons who have been really talked about it. The, the issue is where, where this, this whole discourse with regard to strategic thinking, assertiveness, and approach is being seen from, the, from that point of view. Noburu Ka, uh, Karishma, who is, a, who is a writer, who is, doesn't belong to India, he said most of the narratives in India has been influenced by Marxist ideas. And I'm putting it on record. And he's saying, but with the fall of Soviet Union in the early 1990s, most of these ideas could not find that kind of grounding or rooting. And therefore, we have a lot of discourse with regard to alternate thought process. Uh, interestingly, when you look into the strategic thinking and diplomatic practices, one thing always stand out and which I am very allergic to is Hindu nationalism. You talk to anybody, there is no reference to Muslim nationalism. There is hardly any reference to Christian nationalism. But whenever there is something with regard to India, it's a Hindu nationalism. Superimposed on it, despite the fact that none of our constitutional post is reserved for anybody who has a certain religious affiliation. Now, this is where the thing gets more interesting. Uh, also, when you look into nuclear disarmament, if you take into this case of Ashwatthama, you know, uh, sending the bow and the people will say the whole Srishti will collapse. It is also one of the ingredients of our nuclear disarmament. We knew in our larger thinking that nuclear, you know, uh, the Brahmastra, if it is being sent across, it will create a catastrophe. Again, there were references with regard to Hiroshima and Nagasaki, but it is somewhere that, you know, you need to really work for the global peace and do away with these kind of weapon systems. Uh, and, and, and this state, this understanding of state, the peaceful and the surroundings is also being inherent in our approach. What exactly is it? That one thing which we always aspire for right from Chandragupta Maurya till this date is dialogue. Interestingly, when you counter Samuel Huntington, which talks about clash of civilization, you should also look at it from the point of view of conspiracy. We never said clash of civilization. We should have been the first to talk about dialogue among civilizations, because that is what we have been doing over a period of time. Now, in terms of strategic and other things, you will see India has a great bandwidth from Indo-Soviet friendship treaty to Indo-US nuclear deal, because again, Rahul Sagar talked about interest. This is where we our, locate our interest, and strategic autonomy is one of the uh, foundations on which we have worked on it. Uh, for, for us, the disarmament policy with regard to complete comprehensive disarmament, which Rajiv Gandhi Action Plan also talked about it, but nobody get that kind of a weightage to us, which is critical to understand that whether we want to reformulate our questions to the global audience that what we don't want to do at this point of time. In, in, in the context of smaller nations, we always look into how the smaller nations behave to us, you know, whether they want to do balancing, enmeshment, or, or that kind of a thing. We could, we could, these discourse were also there in ASEAN, when a lot of people take, there is a, there should be balancing between US and China and all those things. But then what exactly is we are really aspiring for? The three spaces that we will have to lo look into, if we want, we want to look into that critical space which is important for us. First is mind space. There are mind games which are being played across the world. Are we prepared for it? Do we have an, what is called, Mind soldiers which can play this thing over a larger period of time. We don't have. Second, digital space. We are doing very good in this regard. The third is knowledge space. We are still aspiring to be the knowledge economy, a growing economy. And these are the three areas where we can really work together. Now, since I have been previously working in a policy circle, so I, let me highlight a few of the policy recommendations to this August audience. First, and this is slightly hard hitting. Uh, first, when you pick up the UGC manual for BA in Defense Strategic Studies, there is not a single paper on Indian strategic thought. 
that clearly showcases that how we are, we are going to prepare with regard to addressing this issue of transition from India to Bharat if we don't have a single paper on Indian strategic thinking, culture, or thought in the UGC paper. Uh, second, in many public service commissions, you will be surprised to know defense and strategic studies paper is being dropped. UPPCS is an excellent example where defense and strategic studies paper has been dropped from the optional core subject, which, which clearly shows how serious we are with regard to this. The third issue is when schools have EVS, environmental studies paper, a book which starts from 8th to 12th, why can't we have a simple booklet which talks about India's strategic legacy and civilization? It might be just for voluntary purposes, but make it a compulsory thing so that people can understand this thing. We need strategic minds to play strategic games. Look into the way other countries are shaping their larger discourses. They have people, young people, to debate on subjects because they have been completely doctored, they have indoctrinated with certain uh, uh, type of aspects, which is very critical. Are we looking for, if you look into the national cyber policy, we need 40,000 cyber experts over the next five years. Have we really worked on the Bharatiya aspect of our discourse if we are really going to talk about what is the next session on Indian way of IR, the Indian you know, dialogue with regard to IR? Uh, we also have one uh, simultaneous thing which is going on, which many of you might be aware of, Maritime History Project, which culminates by the year 2047. We don't have that kind of information with regard to Sivaji Navy, neither Chola's Navy. And therefore, we need to connect the strategic and maritime history project together so as to build up a new knowledge which is comprehensive and known to it. We should thank Singapore and Southeast Asian countries. You know why? When you open the Cambridge history of Southeast Asia, many of the references with regard to Indic civilization are coming into that and you feel proud about it, that how we have assimilated their culture and projected it over there. Over there you will find that Cynic want to, Cynic civilization, the approach has been to taking the princes away back to China and then trying to have their Cynic way in terms of, uh, 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 in terms of their approach. Uh, when yoga is for global health, why can't Kautilya could be for larger strategic thought? And, and I thank many of my colleagues who have been working on Kautilya, but we need to disseminate what Kautilya is about. Maybe a small booklet, both in digital and physical form, which is available to really disseminate to the people because everybody wants shorter version of any, any dialogue or discourse. Uh, one interesting thing which, were, uh, which I was doing uh, GNU, uh, MA in JNU was Hind Swaraj. Five rupee booklet, you have to really read it to understand and answer the questions. Can we have something of that sort with regard to our civilizational thing? Because that is that means a compulsory aspect of it. Uh, International Conference on Strategic Thought is good. 2018, the same university has done Indian strategic and, and, and related conference. Can we make it an annual event? Annual event, bringing about all the Indic historians, Indic researchers together and, and work uh, uh, accordingly. Another thing which I want to highlight, in 2001, LM Singhvi report was one of the milestones with regard to understanding our Indian diaspora, which gave birth to Pravasi Bharti Devas and Saman and all. We need to work with regard to Indian strategic culture. Because when we were young, we used to get in Sunday newspaper dots, we connect the dots and we get the whole picture or the animal whosoever is there and we feel proud about it. We do have the dots which is need to be done. Another issue, when there is a lot of things which is talked about greater Iran, greater Turkey, which is there in discourse. Whenever there is about discourse with regard to Akhand Bharat and greater India, all the hell broke loose. That why India can aspire to be a greater India, magnificent India, incredible India. So that is where there is a problem. Also, when you look into, into, into the, the, the change from idealistic notions of Nehru to more Lal Bahadur Shastri who was a rationalist, realist, and then Indira Gandhi who, was, who, who took an antithesis to his father and said nuclear power is one of the aspects that we should really talk about. It. Even though it's a controversial, she meant to say nuclear powered submarine, but people say she was well aware of, the, of, the, uh, of this thing. Uh, one thing which I want to highlight is that whether Chola history was compulsorily avoided because we wanted to build a narrative of anti-colonial struggle. 
because Cholas were automatically seen as a imperialist forces. So was it compulsorily avoided just to do it? And last, when you want to bring about debate on national strategy, security, and culture, we should have a document for all the IR students on national security strategy and culture, at least a working paper, which everybody can talk about it. And last is the invocation of gods, but we need an invocation of constitutional, of civilizational identity and glory. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, you had a number of ideas presented to you in regard to our strategic culture, regional challenges, and the diplomatic way that India should adopt. We have time for only two questions. And therefore, very quickly, if you could ask those questions, we will. Yes, sir. Thank you, Rahul. Uh, I, I have a question specifically, or two, three brief, very short questions specifically addressed to you. And it's partly an admiration for your work and your mining of these traditions. But in that spirit, I want to take this conversation ahead. First, uh, I think when it comes to sort of thinking about how we navigate these inheritances, I was curious about two aspects. One, while well, thinking about traditions, where do we begin and what do we treat as part of this notion of the tradition itself? Partly because I'm thinking about you know, the whole range of anti-colonial responses, uh, also as part of an inheritance, you know, and a part of a very rich and diverse inheritance. So for instance, uh, I think you mentioned Gandhi, and I, I sort of may concur with you maybe that Gandhi got the Jewish question wrong, but Gandhi got many other things right, um, and, for no, and for good reason. Uh, Martin Luther King or a Nelson Mandela around the world were inspired by his ideals. Uh, so I was wondering here again, while thinking about even these figures and their inheritances, I would treat that inheritance and that resolution or thinking about the past as also one response which is part of this crucible of tradition. And I wouldn't sort of ferret it out and say that this is disrespectful to the earlier traditions, uh, which uh, of course may be pointed in a slightly different direction. So maybe we can live with all of this uh, is one thought I have which I wanted to sort of put forward. The second idea, you know, I think you mentioned in terms of regime type and as, as exemplars of uh, the sort of consolidation of national will, Singapore and China, you know, so I mean, I take pride in the fact that India is an open democracy. And to me, China and Singapore are not in that same ballpark, you know? Uh, uh, so is your argument, I want to get you correctly here, is your argument to suggest that abridgments of democracy are part of this uh, attempt and deal at sort of working something else which is of higher order magnitude and importance? Uh, and finally, a third thought, which is about, yeah, I'll just keep this very brief. Okay, very brief one line. Uh, the whole disconnect idea. Um, is there a danger or risk of a certain degree of insularity when it comes to the realm of ideas uh, in this domain because of a disconnect? Thank you. Thanks, uh, Siddharth. Those are profound questions, all of which will get me in trouble. Thank you for that. Um, I, I don't propose China and Singapore as models that you simply replicate unthinkingly. But what I'm talking about specifically in that case are tactics that they have used. Uh, you, can, uh, you can always borrow widely from all sorts of regime types uh, and apply uh, you know, their, their methods. That might include developing your own digital public sphere so that you aren't entirely reliant on Twitter or Facebook or whatever new AI engine comes out for moderation so that you aren't always chasing your tail uh, in, in uh, diplomatic crises. And one of the noticeable things about diplomatic crises, what's limiting India's or challenging India's diplomatic uh, uh, performance or functioning, let's say functioning in the last year or two are social media controversies that spin out of control and create unwanted stress, tension, trouble, and they soak up time and energy. They intended to soak up our time and energy. And the Chinese understood this very well long ago that it's easy for outsiders to distract you. So we need to find a solution. It doesn't have to be, and rarely does India do something exactly that somebody else does. We have this genius of finding our own way. So I was suggesting that we find our own way. And similarly, on the point of disconnection, the two are related, I'll say the same thing. When we think about India going out or India disconnecting or forging its own path, it doesn't have to follow the American path, which is primarily has focused on military intervention. It doesn't have to follow the Chinese path, which is focused primarily on trade and investment. And one of the reasons they can do that is because they're wealthier. Uh, we can find another way. 
um, and I wanted to leave it open to the, to the, especially to the probationers and to the, the members of the Foreign Service to think about what that way is going to be, but I wanted to emphasize it's inevitable. Uh, and just to end on the multiplicity of traditions, you're absolutely right that there's a multiplicity of traditions. I, I don't uh, deny that. I think that the question is at certain points in your life, uh, in the life of a nation, you make choices and you certainly prioritize one over the other. So you can say it's been part of our tradition to think about the anti-colonial movement. And I try to contextualize it to make you understand or make everyone understand where that came from. But at some subsequent point, you realize that that way of thinking belonged to an era, met certain interests of that era, and doesn't answer the questions that you confront today. So there, it's not an ungrateful shedding of the past, but it is sometimes a shedding of the past, or at least a, a, a sense that the, the past got some questions and answers wrong. I must apologize. I've been instructed to stop. Uh, so there is food for thought for you and thought for food. So we'll stop. I will pause at this point. What we've thrown up is a huge number of ideas relating to where we have come from, what are the factors that have shaped our strategic culture, what challenges India faces, and what kind of diplomatic effort it needs to make. Let us pause here. This is part of a long process of reflection, of study, and of uh, writing and uh, reading and writing about this. We have some way to go. We are at a very, very rudimentary stage at this point. But thank you very much for giving us this opportunity to speak to you and to share some thoughts with you. All good wishes. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you, Dr. Sagar, for that very fascinating exposition on the topic. Uh, Dr. Bish, Dr. Uh, Professor Pankas Jha for such enlightening discussions that we had this uh, afternoon. And a very special thanks to Ambassador Talmisa Hamad for chairing the session on this very pertinent topic, diplomatic practices in foreign policy, the Indian way. May I now request our Vice Chancellor, Dr. Ramakrishnan Raman, uh, to felicitate uh, the speakers, sir.